Random event generators are electronic tosses of the coin. One type of random number generator experiment that's been conducted many, many times, hundreds of times, over the past four decades or so, since around the 1960s, has been a random generator that only produces sequences of random bits, zeros and ones, like, like flipping coins. And you would simply ask somebody to press a button, it would produce 200 bits, and you would ask them to say, well, try to make it produce more one bits than zero bits. And when you take the entire body of, of literature, all of the hundreds of experiments that have been done, you can ask a single question. Did it matter that people were trying to push it towards ones or push it towards zeros? And the overall answer is, yes, it does matter. That somehow intention is correlated with the operation, with the output of these random number generators, such that if you wish for more ones, somehow the generators produce more ones. One of the most interesting uh, experiments with random event generators occurred um, when it was really out of time. Some of the Princeton investigators and some of the other ones decided that they would try to see whether or not you could affect a, a, a random machine after it had run. So they converted it, instead of having a computer with a visual screen, they had a, com a computerized situation that was um, audio tapes. And they had it with left cl uh, clicks in the left ear and clicks in the right ear. And they already played this with nobody listening to it, so that it, it, it already ran. They put that in a vault, and they then gave the, the tape, the already run tape, to a participant and said, take it home, I want you to listen to it, and I want you to, to make more left ear clicks than right ear clicks with it. Send your intention to it. So the person did, they handed back the tape, and they played it, and lo and behold, and they played the one in the vault too, and they discovered that they were both the same, and they both had more left clicks than right clicks. So what was going on here? Well, it wasn't as though the person who was the participant had actually affected it at the moment he was listening to it. His thoughts and his attention had moved back down the timeline and affected it at the moment it was generated. When this leads naturally to wonder, do people, are people affecting the world of reality that they see? You betcha they are. Every single one of us affects the reality that we see, even if we try to hide from that and play victim. We all are doing it. Modern materialism strips people of the need to feel responsible. And often enough, so does religion. But I think if you take quantum mechanics seriously enough, it puts the responsibility squarely in your lap. It in the molecular structure of water and what affects it. Now water is the most receptive of the four elements. Mr. Emoto thought perhaps it would respond to non-physical events. So he set up a series of studies, applied mental stimuli and photographed it with a dark field microscope. This first picture is a picture of water from the Fujiwara Dam. And this picture is the same water after receiving a blessing from a Zen Buddhist monk. Now, in this next series of pictures, Mr. Emoto printed out words, taped them to bottles of distilled water, and left them out overnight. This first photograph is a picture of the pure distilled water, just the essence of itself. These subsequent photographs, as you can see, are each different. This is the Chi of Love. And we move along here to thank you. And you can see where he taped that uh, to this bottle here. But if you read Japanese, you already knew that. <laughs> now, Mr. Emoto speaks of the thought or intent being the driving force in all of this. The science of how that actually affects the molecules is unknown, except to the water molecules, of course. And it's really fascinating when you keep in mind that 90% of our bodies are water. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? If thoughts can do that to water, 
Imagine what our thoughts can do to us. Uh, ultimately, what we'd like to see is, what is the physics of consciousness? We can ask that question today. What is consciousness? Where does it come from? What are the origins of consciousness? What are the limits of human potential? We're in a position to actually answer that now, I believe, although there's certainly not consensus yet in the scientific community about that. But with the real cutting-edge knowledge, the discovery of the unified field, the so-called superstring field, we now understand that life is fundamentally one. At the basis of all life's diversity, there is unity. At our basis, you and I are one. And that unity at the basis of mind and matter is consciousness, universal consciousness. So with that deep understanding that consciousness isn't created by the brain, it's not purely an outcome of molecular chemical processes in the brain, but is fundamental in nature. It's the very core of nature. We call it the unified field. Now that we have that foundational understanding of what consciousness is, we can solve the mind-body problem, we can see how consciousness percolates up through our physiology to become the consciousness that we experience and see and sensory perception and all of that. So there is a foundation now to really link rigorously neuroscience with quantum physics. That might be really a next step in the development of the movie. You've asked the questions in the first movie. Now we're just on the verge of being able to answer those questions. So you mentioned the unified field for people who never a lot of people are going well that sounds nice it's unified everything's one could you dive a little more technically into what the unified field is progress in our understanding of the universe through physics over the past quarter century has been exploring deeper levels of natural law from the macroscopic to the microscopic from the molecular to the atomic to the nuclear to subnuclear levels of nature's functioning, so-called electroweak unified scale, grand unified scale, super unified scale. And what we've discovered at the core basis of the universe, the foundation of the universe, is a single universal field of intelligence, a field which unites gravity with electromagnetism, light, with radioactivity, with the nuclear force, so that all the forces of nature and all the so-called particles of nature, quarks, leptons, protons, neutrons, are now understood to be one. They're all just different ripples on a single ocean of existence. That's called the unified field or superstring field, and it's a mathematical tour de force. But we have realized Einstein's dream. He dedicated half of his life to discovering this unified field. And now in the context of the superstring, that has been achieved. So unified field theories based on the superstring identify a single universal field of intelligence, an ocean of existence at the basis of everything, mind and matter. And all the so-called particles of the universe, the forces in our universe, everything in the universe are just ripples of on that ocean of existence. That's the unified field. And that field is not is a non-material field. It is ultimately the field of consciousness. And all our separate consciousness, wherever there's consciousness, is merely consciousness by virtue of the fact that my consciousness, your consciousness, are ultimately that. Everything in the universe is really nothing but that. Planets, trees, people, animals, we're all just waves of vibration of this underlying unified superstring field. We are really united at our core. And ultimately, the understanding that's emerging will be that there is only one consciousness in this room. And it is you. And it is me. And it is each and every one of us. We individualize our consciousness through the filter of our nervous system. But the consciousness itself, our very inner subjectivity, the self in the big sense, that is universal. And knowing that, ex knowing it through experience, is called enlightenment and has been called enlightenment through the ages. It sounds like you're going down through the, the physical realms, leptons, you know, smaller, smaller, and you're saying at the base, it's not solid, it's intelligence. Why do you use the word intelligence? That is a very brilliant question. It, what you're saying really reflects a bias that all of us share. Everyone who's grown up in the scientific world is used to the concept that we're living in a material universe, an inert universe, a universe of dead matter. 
And because of that, <clears throat> it's difficult instinctively to grasp that we're not really living in a dead universe, that the universe is overwhelmingly conscious at its basis. See, what we have seen and studied for 300 years of classical physics is what we call billiard ball mechanics, macroscopic physics, classical physics, the physics of billiard balls, cannonballs, and planets. But quantum mechanics, even at the molecular level, let alone atomic, nuclear, subnuclear, in the realm of quantum mechanics, the idea of particle is replaced by the idea of wave function. And what is a wave function? Technically, it's a vector in a linear space. But what's a vector in a linear space? What's it made of? What's the substance of nature? Well, a wave function, a vector in a linear space, is made of the same stuff thoughts are made of. We're li really living in a thought universe, a conceptual universe. Quantum mechanics is just the play and display of potentiality. So the point I'm making is the deeper you go in the structure of natural law, the less material, the less inert, the less dead the universe is, the more alive, the more conscious the universe becomes. Then when you get to the foundation of the universe, the unified field or superstring field, it's simply a field of pure being, pure intelligence. Intelligence because it's the fountainhead of all the laws of nature, all the fundamental forces, all the fundamental particles, all the laws governing life at every level of the universe have their unified source in the unified field. That makes the unified field the most concentrated field of intelligence in nature. Non-material, dynamic, self-aware intelligence. Those are the properties of the unified. The deepest level of truth uncovered by science and by philosophy is the fundamental truth of unity. At that deepest subnuclear level of our reality, you and I are literally one. 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 This gradually led into some notions that there was an invisible connection between everything. Physicists give this a name. They call it entanglement. I'm going to show you very quickly some of the early research. This is the first study, and I won't go into it in great detail except to say that this experiment was performed in the Middle East during the peak of the Lebanon War in the early 1980s. It was hypothesized, based on many previous smaller experiments, that if enough people were collectively experiencing and stimulating this fundamental, powerful field of peace within, that there would be a radiated influence of peace that would affect the behavior of people throughout society. This chart shows a dotted line going up and down, which is the rise and fall on a daily basis of the number of people who were meditating as a group in Jerusalem, about a 1,000 people on average, sometimes more, sometimes less. And the solid line represents progress towards peace in the war in neighboring Lebanon. And even before the benefit of statistical analysis, you can almost see from the raw data that progress towards peace, measured by reduced war deaths, reduced war injuries, reduced number of bombs, that progress towards peace goes up and down almost in lockstep with the number of people who are meditating as a group. Radio. Transcendental meditation is a simple, natural, effortless mental technique. Practice sitting comfortably with the eyes closed, typically for 15 to 20 minutes, twice a day. And the technique turns the awareness within to explore inside deeper levels of thought. That means quieter levels of the thinking process until the mind comes to a state of complete rest, quiet inner wakefulness. And in this so-called meditative state, where the awareness is maximally expanded and the mind completely at rest, the body simultaneously gains a state of rest at least three times deeper than sleep. And it's that state of profound physiological rest that is responsible for the wide-ranging physiological benefits, prevention of disease, promotion of health, promotion of longevity, increased dynamism that come from the practice, and it's the state of quiet inner alertness, which is accompanied by what's called EEG coherence, that is responsible for the brain development, increased creativity, intelligence, learning ability that results from transcendental meditation.